Children's Church. If you want to go ahead and dismiss your kiddos for Children's Church, you're free to do that now. They'll be back here in a bit. If you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 34. We'll get the, the lights up so you can see your, your Bible here in just a minute. Chapter 14 of Proverbs, verse 34. And uh, this morning, we, um, I'm going to spend some time, at least this morning and maybe over the next couple weeks, as we prepare for... Uh, what I believe in this country is to be a consequential election. We hear a lot of cliche phrases these days. This is the greatest. This is the most important. I think every election, every time that uh, America is called upon to, to vote on a leader is a consequential election. And there seems to always be things, uh, amendments and acts and all these sorts of things that are, uh, that are at the, the decision of people to make. We have before us as a, as a nation the opportunity to, to vote in the upcoming election to determine who's going to be the next president of the United States and serve this country in that capacity the next four years. And fortunately, we have a voice in making that decision. There are other uh, consequential amendments and issues at stake with regard to the, the election that's coming up. And I think it behooves us as a church to spend some time addressing the matter so that we are informed and our, our convictions are biblically sharpened. I understand, I hope, that most of what I say this morning that you're probably going to say, uh, hopefully you'll say amen to it. I, 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 I'm, I know that we're in agreement. I'm, I'm quite certain of that. However, we have an opportunity to share this message beyond the walls of this church through our radio broadcast and our live feed, so we don't know who's going to hear the, the, the message and who will be impacted by it. But nonetheless, I, I share this morning's message because I believe if, it's, if we remain silent as a church with regard to the issues of our day, then we forfeit our right to speak biblically into the culture. We, we, we in some ways forego our, our opportunity to say something biblically, and I don't want the church to be quiet on the issues that are of biblical nature that the church needs to address. And so this morning... Uh, I want to share with you from Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, among other passages, but it's my desire for the people of God to be informed by the wisdom of God as we approach this election. And uh, chapter 14 of verse 34 of the book of Proverbs has something to say to us this morning. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? We read this one simple verse together, and then we'll pray and be seated, all right? Verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, I want you to get your money's worth here. So we'll read it one more time, all right? Only up and down, unless you think I've turned this into an exercise, you know, up and down real quick. We wouldn't want to do that. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that it has a way of changing our hearts. And it, in your word is the revelation that you, Jesus, are the Savior of the world. That we can have hope and we can have eternal life in Christ. That's the chief message of Scripture. We also believe that the Scriptures teach us and inform us. And we, have what, we can have a biblical convictions about the world in which we live. We can understand things and we can respond to them. And it gives us a, 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 a clear mind to understand what's going on in the world and respond to it in a godly way, in a biblical way. And so this morning I pray that you would give us the wisdom of God as we look here in the book of Proverbs, that we would adopt this wisdom as our own wisdom. We desire this wisdom to be our wisdom. We approach life with the wisdom of God. Thank you for the book of Proverbs and the wisdom that it is. May it sharpen our hearts, change our minds, and give us great conviction. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. It's my desire for us as the people of God to be informed by the wisdom of God as we approach this election. We have a a consequential election coming up, and it's an, it gives us an opportunity to respond. How should we respond? What should our response be? How should we approach these things? And furthermore, are we informed enough to make a decision? Uh, I know many of you probably are studied up. Some of you perhaps not. Uh, you probably say, politics, oh, pastor, that's just politics. I, I don't have anything to do with all that. Some of you, that's you eat, live, breathe, and sleep it. You watch it all the time. You study it out thoroughly. You understand the issues of, of our day. The book of Proverbs we turn to this morning is wisdom literature. That's what it is. It teaches us the wisdom of God. You want to know the wisdom of God? 
If anyone lacks wisdom, the Bible says you ask God and he'll give it to you. I'd also say if you want to know the wisdom of God, read the wisdom of God in the book of Proverbs. The wisdom, of, the, the wisdom that's found there in the book of Proverbs teaches us how to do life, how to speak, how to relate, how to avoid sin, the kinds of things that God would be pleased with in our lives. It's very practical application of, of godly wisdom and it teaches us how to live our lives. It just so happens in the book of Proverbs, we find something of some verses, I should say, that speak to the issues at hand and the kind of impact that righteousness or sin can have on a people. I dare even say a church, a community, a family, a nation. The wisdom of God makes its home and application in all those areas. And so there are two ways that the wisdom of this proverb should impact our response during this current election cycle. The first thing I give you this morning is this. The first way that the wisdom of God should impact our lives is this. this. The wisdom of Proverbs teaches us to champion righteousness. We should, as a church, be champions of righteousness. Now, friends, I understand there's no, no no one's perfectly righteous. But there are some decisions before us where we can either make decisions to to further ungodliness and unrighteousness or try to curtail it. And if that were your two choices, which would you take? Would you try to stem the, 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 stem the flow, stem the tide of unrighteousness? Or would you just say, well, let it be unrestrained. Let unrighteousness be unrestrained in our nation. The wisdom of Proverbs teaches us to champion righteousness. I think in the Bible there's a couple folks, and you could probably think of some more, that were champions of righteousness. My mind goes to Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. In the book of Daniel, he is, finds himself being taken captive, if you will, into exile as the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And Daniel, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they find themselves in exile. They're in a people that, that are not their own. They've been taken from their hometown. They've been taken from their their home church, if you will. They've been taken from their family, and they've been placed, they've been taken from their culture, and they've been placed in an ungodly culture with an ungodly leader in a, an ungodly people under the oppression of, of other ungodly leaders and away from their family. They've been removed from everything they knew. They have been place then in this environment that is much different than the one they grew up in, than the one they were raised in, than what they knew as a kid growing up. And now they find themselves under a different government, if you will, under different leaders, and with an opportunity to make a decision that would impact their lives before God or remain true to who they were, who they are. And Daniel, he, um, as you know, was a champion, I believe, for righteousness. He was a champion for righteousness. Now, there are some of you here this morning that perhaps you feel like Daniel. You grew up in a, in a day and time that was much different than the day and time we live in now. Under different leadership than the leadership that we have now. Under different issues than the issues that we face now. And you think, well, what do I do? Well, I can tell you what Daniel did when he was removed from everything he knew. In verse 8 of Daniel, chapter 1, we find that Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. And he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion on the side of the chief eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel... I fear my Lord, the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. And then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearances and the appearances of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to to what you see. Daniel says, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to take what this ungodly king wants to give me. I'm not going to do it. 
And he dared take a stand and say, you know what? I'm not taking the food. I'm not taking what this ungodly king wants to give me. I'm not going to do it. And he dared step up and say so and say, I'm not going to take it. I'm not, I'm not eating this. We're not eating this stuff. And you test and see if I'm not right. Well, Daniel stood on his conviction. And, of course, as the time played out, Daniel was right. and God honored Daniel. In verse 17 of Daniel 1, it says, As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel, as a man of principle and righteousness, stood on his convictions in a, such a way that he desired to honor the Lord. And he did so even at the risk of offending the king. And God honored that and gave Daniel great wisdom and insight. He was a champion for doing what was right. And God honored that. I think of another man by the name of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. Elijah had come to a part, point in his ministry in 1 Kings chapter 18. And he, he set forth a challenge to the prophets of Baal. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, you understand the story. There was this challenge that was set forth whether. Um, and the challenge was that the prophets of Baal had an opportunity to call on their God to consume this offering from heaven, with the fire from heaven. And, 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 then Dan, and Elijah was going to call on his God and going to call on the living God to consume his offering on the altar. And they were going to see who was going to win. You remember the story. Elijah, he... He was no um, advocate of the prophets of Baal, was he? he? He was no friend of the prophets of Baal. He, he didn't like him. He wasn't going to stand for the unrighteousness that was the prophets of Baal. And so he said, here's what we're going to do. You get this, you do this, you do this, and I'm going to do this, but you go first. And so the prophets of Baal, they got together there, and they, they put the, the offering there, and they wailed, and they, they cried out, and they cut themselves, and and Elijah stood there. Maybe, maybe your God's asleep. And they wailed and they cut up. And then came, and, and of course they couldn't do it because their God's not real. He's, he's not a God at all. He, he's dead. Then Elijah's turn came. Put the offering on the altar. Poured water all over it. Elijah prayed and God sent fire from heaven and licked up all the water and burned up the offering. It took the prophets of Baal and slew the prophets of Baal. Elijah was a champion for the righteousness of God. Daniel, I believe, was a champion for the righteousness of God. We have before us an opportunity to be the champions of righteousness in our day, and it's fitting for the church to champion righteousness. We should champion righteousness. Righteousness, the Bible says, exalts a nation. Not unrighteousness, not sin. Not ungodliness, not immorality, not brokenness, righteousness. And righteousness that exalts a nation is found in the Lord Jesus. Righteousness that exalts a nation is found in the Lord Jesus, and it's found in the message that gospel preaching, Bible believing churches preach. That's the righteousness that exalts a nation. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 10 and 11, it says, When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it's overthrown. When the church is doing well, when the gospel-preaching, Bible-believing church is, is doing well, 
And the, the people gather to worship on Sunday and they live out their faith in the public sector. <coughs> they live out their faith uh, as, as councilmen. And council, yeah, they, they, they live out their faith as teachers in the, in the school district. They live out their faith at their jobs as bankers. They live out their faith as, as educators. They live out their faith. They live out their faith working with children. They live out their faith as workers at Walmart. They live out their faith as, as retirees in a community. They, they live out their faith in Jesus Christ. And they advocate their God the, the, for, for the Lord Jesus to advocate their biblical worldview. And they live out their faith. It goes well with the city. And if it goes well with the city, it'll go well for the state if more people do that. And if it goes well for the state, it'll go well for the nation because it's righteousness that exalts the nation. It's, 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 it's the righteousness that causes people to say, Amen. The city rejoices. But I tell you what, friends, when, the, when sin enters the community and ungodliness reigns in the state and ungodly ungodly things and ungodly sinful behaviors reign in the nation, the nation will shrivel. Oh, it'll be a dread. It'll be a dread. And even those who advocate for unrighteousness, they'll eventually not be able to live with their unrighteous decisions and they won't like that. You look. You look at the America. Well, let's advocate, they say, to make illegal drugs that were illegal for many, many years. Let's make them legal. We should make them legal, they say. They advocate for the unrighteousness of illegal drug use. Let's, let's do that, they say. Well we, well, we can't do that without there being consequences. And then illegal drug use becomes rampant. People's lives are wasted. Homeless camps get set up. Sin and debauchery infect a community. And even those who advocate for it, they say, this is, this is not right. It doesn't exalt anything. Sinful, ungodly behavior doesn't exalt anything. It doesn't cause anybody to rejoice. It doesn't cause uh, any city, any community, any, anybody to say, that's great. You see, because sin is sin and it stinks, no matter the shade, no matter the color. Righteousness exalts a nation. And so, friends, we must be champions of righteousness. We must be champions of righteousness. It should be our great pursuit. In Jeremiah chapter 29, there's instruction given to, uh, by Jeremiah in chapter 29. If you look there in verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile <coughs> from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Je Jeconiah and the queen mother and the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of El Elasa, the son of Shaphan, uh, and Gemariah, and the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent in exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, <coughs> build houses and live in them, plant vineyards and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters a marriage, and they, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there. And do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. To these exiles, the Lord said, seek the welfare of the city. Seek the welfare of the city. Seek the city. Seek its welfare. Well, how does the people of God today look at the culture in which we live in? And what should our response be? Should it be silence? No, it shouldn't be silence. We must seek the welfare of the city. And how do we do that? Well, we advocate for that which is biblical regarding issues that politicians are saying today are unbiblical. <coughs> and so we must, we must pursue and seek righteousness. It exalts a nation. I think of Esther. Esther had an opportunity to stand in a point in time in her life to save the life of the Jews. 
Mordecai explained to her, you, 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 perhaps that God has raised you up for such a time as this. And she spoke. And as a result, lives were saved. We must be people who champion righteousness. The second way the, the, the book of Proverbs teaches us is this. The wisdom of Proverbs teaches us to understand the impact of sin on a people. Now you look in verse 14. It's a very simple verse. Righteousness exalts a nation. Everybody gets excited. But then sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a reproach to any people. Well, we understand what that means. You sin, mm, it's a reproach. But what happens when a nation is walking off into sin? What happens when, when a nation walks off into sin. You see, sin, the decisions that are made by leadership and those leaders being approved or voted into office by the citizens of the nation, those actions are, are a reproach, could be a potential reproach for the people. It just so happens that we currently face the possibility of some very unrighteous and, un, and, and very sinful actions being uh, made permissible in our nation, depending on how the election plays out. And I, I speak to you this, uh, speak on this because <clears throat> they are biblical issues, not political issues. Excuse me for just a minute. And as such, the church must speak to matters so the Bible can address the issues and shape the hearts and minds of believers and subsequently call unbelievers to Christ. The first issue that I, I want to address that is clearly sin, that is a reproach to people and is not something that exalts a nation, is the issue of abortion. We have an issue right now that is abortion that's being politicized, and there's political fighting about the issue of abortion. Now, I know where you all stand. Uh, I understand that we, we defend the life of the unborn. That we would believe abortion to be murder. And there's people who advocate for this sort of thing. And they, all, they do it in the name of women's rights. But I wonder if all the women's rights folks think, well, what about the rights of the unborn baby? Who's going to talk about the rights that that baby has? He doesn't have a voice, but he's alive. And he's a viable baby. Who's going to speak for his rights? The first uh, issue is abortion, and it, it's, it's become a political issue, but it's a biblical issue, and it's a biblical issue long before it's a political issue. What if I told you there was a political candidate who voted against protecting babies, and this comes from the Decision Magazine put out by the Billy Graham organization. What if, I, what if I told you there was a political candidate who voted against protecting babies who survived a failed abortion attempt and did so and supported that action twice. In other words, I'm not going to do anything to protect the life of, an, of a baby who was born alive as a result of a failed abortion. I'm not going to protect that baby. Do nothing for that baby. If you want to go ahead and kill it after that, then we're not going to do anything to protect that baby. What if I told you that there was a political candidate who, endo who endorsed the, the Women's Health Protection Act, which would strike down more than 1,300 state pro-life laws? What if I told you that? Would you vote for that candidate? I would assume that m most of you, if not all of you, would not not vote for that candidate. I'll leave you to decide which candidate that is. And if you want to know which candidate that is, you can ask me. Um, she, she is a, a, a candidate for the president. So I'll leave the rest of that to you, all right? <clears throat> Currently in the state of Missouri... You see yard signs around that advocate for Amendment 3. And fortunately, most of the signs that I see around, all but one of them up in the north part of our community, I've only seen one that said we need to do this. But anyway, they all say vote no on Amendment 3. I like those signs that say no on Amendment 3. <laughs> you see, the... the, the uh, the Amendment 3 is, is, a, is not a good, is in my opinion, it's really bad. And I'm going to share some things. I sent this out in the church newsletter not long ago. Missouri Right to Life, they explained 10 reasons to oppose pro-abortion Amendment 3. 
First of all, parental consent laws will be eliminated if that were to pass. Abortion and all nine months would be allowed. No alternatives allowed. This amendment callously disregards the unborn child. It says in the alternatives to sacrificing his or her life in future while helping his or her mother. Fourth, health and safety standards would be eliminated. Missouri's pro-life laws will be eliminated. Women will lose the ability to sue for malpractice. PRC's uh, pregnancy resource centers will be forced to re refer for abortion. Ultrasounds will be eliminated. In other words, abortion clinics will no longer be required to offer or show a mother her baby's ultrasound image. There will be a significant loss of money in, to Missouri. M Missouri could suffer a significant loss to state and local revenue if this language is enshrined in the Missouri Constitution and taxpayer-funded abortions. If abortion is enshrined as a right in our Missouri Constitution, your legislator uh, will be unable to refuse to appropriate funds to abortion providers. It's interesting that uh, uh, Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft wrote truthful ballot language, which was uh, uh, unfortunately uh, come under fire by those who didn't like him doing this. But the fair ballot language says this, a yes vote for Amendment 3 will enshrine the right to abortion at any time of a pregnancy in the Missouri Constitution. Additionally, it will prohibit any regulation of abortion, including regulation designed to protect women undergoing abortions and prohibit any civil or criminal recourse against anyone who performs an abortion and hurts or kills the pregnant woman. A no vote will continue the statutory prohibition of abortion in Missouri. Now, listen, I, I, I give you that information. Why? Because, friends, the Bible explains to us in Psalm 139, Verse 6, 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Those little babies that are in the mama's wombs need to be protected. And they cannot be treated as some sort of waste that we can just murder in the womb by some sort of politicians who want to make a biblical issue a political issue. And diabolically, I would dare say, murder thousands of little babies in their mama's bellies. It says, I, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of, of, of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. <clears throat> in your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Friends, we must speak justly, and because we love justice and righteousness, we must speak for those who can't speak for themselves. So that's why I really, I really, really like those signs that say vote no on Amendment 3. I'll just leave that there. I really like those signs. I'm particularly a big fan of those. I would encourage you to be a big fan as well. But I can't tell you exactly how to vote or probably the IRS will show up this week sometime. But that's, I'm just telling you what I like. How about that? This is what I like. I like this too. Hopefully you like it with me. Amen. Jeremiah 1 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. I, I, I knew you. The second issue, we will understand abortion. The second issue, very quickly, I'm going to run out of time. The second issue, so, so that's a sin, okay? Just so you know where we're going with the Proverbs. That's a sin. What I just talked about, abortion is a sin, and, the, and sin is a reproach to any people. That's a specific example of a sin. And if we're going to be champions of righteousness, then we've got to stand against stuff like that, right? Second one, I think, that's worth standing. The second issue that we have to understand is, is the issue that has to do with the free exercise of religion. He said, Pastor, what about that? What's all that mean? Well, listen, here's the thing. This is important because we want to be able to express our convictions as Christians without, being, without facing the, the threat of prosecution for doing so. Especially when it comes to things like I just said, and especially if I were to say to things like, I don't believe in homosexual marriage, I don't believe in transgenderism, I don't believe in any of that. I think it's ungodly and unbiblical. I think it's wrong. It's not right in God's sight. You see, I need to be able to say things like that without facing the threat of prosecution for doing so. Why? Because I frankly don't care what politicians say, it's what the Bible says. And the Bible says that that sort of lifestyle is wrong, it's sinful, it's ungodly. And so the question, do we or will we be able to live in a society where I can speak out based on, where we can speak out based on our values that are consistent with our faith in Christ and belief in what the Bible says without being prosecuted to do so? You see, that's one of the issues that's at stake with the election at hand, you see. 
Because there's a currently an act that if passed would infringe on our rights to do so. And it's called the Equality Act. And the Equality Act was introduced by the House of Representatives uh, by a lady by the name of Nancy Pelosi on February 18, 2021. The House passed it on February 25, 2021. And this act, the Heritage Foundation explains that the Equality Act would ultimately lead to the erasure of women by dismantling sex-specific facilities, i.e. bathrooms, sports, and other female-only places. It would also... It would also make it illegal for me to say what I just said and for us to stand on a biblical conviction about same-sex marriage and homosexuality and transgenderism. You see, if I were to say that under the Equality Act, I would be discriminating and I would be breaking the law and be discriminating against those people. I don't have a problem when it comes to discrimination with uh, people of, you know, uh, uh, we shouldn't discriminate against race and all that. I get that. But moral issues of the Bible that speaks regarding who can be married and who should not be married, that's a biblical issue. And we need to be able to freely say that's wrong. What if I said there was a political candidate who supports the Equality Act, which would criminalize employees, medical professionals, parents, and organizations that hold biblical views of sexuality? That was Again, a quote from the Decision Magazine by Billy Graham. What if I said there was a candidate? What if I said that this candidate um, who supported this was a female? We, we have a political candidate that supports this kind of legislation. But listen, when God created man, he created the male and female. And he, tell, he, he tells us that a man should leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife. And the woman, and they two shall become one. In the Hebrew, he made them, uh, I believe it's Ish and Isha. He made them male and female. Adam and Eve. Yesterday I had an opportunity to, to serve as the, the minister who, who, who uh, presided over our, uh, my wife and I's niece's wedding. So I was at a wedding yesterday. I, Married, I got to marry my niece and her and her new husband, Cody Brown. It was in a tree farm. It was a lovely time, really. It was a beautiful night. They set that uh, wedding venue up just just right at five o'clock, so the sun would be shining right in my eyes, right here. Uh, but it sure was nice on them. It really highlighted everything because they were all looking this way. It was a nice day for them. We left uh, James Sport about eight fifteen, eight thirty last night, and got home just after midnight. So. We're a little jet lagged, and so that's that's a good thing. So, amen. But listen, God made a man and woman, and, and He didn't make them man and man. He didn't make them female and female, that a female should leave her mom and dad and be joined to another female. That doesn't work that way. And the other thing that doesn't work is all this stuff about, well, I don't know what I am. Am I a man or am I a woman? What am I? That doesn't work. We don't leave it up to, to kids to determine who they are. Listen, I'm a, I'm a little old school. I think boys ought to have blue and girls ought to have pink. And I think that's the way we raise them from the womb, you know. Girls do this, little sister. And little boys, they do this. We throw rocks and throw sticks and we, sh- we shoot guns and we go hunting, you know. And little sister, you do the things you do, you know. You're going to help mama. You're going to be pretty and we're going to brush your hair and you're going to put bows in your hair. You're going to do all those things. That's just the way little girls are, are raised, right? I'm okay with all that. I, we don't leave it up to this. I don't know what gender I am. That's, that's confusion. And the biggest thing about all this, there's enough confusion for our students, church. They don't need any more confusion about what they are, what they're not. and who, They don't need any more confusion. And who stands between them and the confusion? It's the church. We stand between them and the confusion. We've got to say something. We've got to be champions of righteousness. Because this sin, this sin is a reproach. And it's confusing our students. The third issue, if I dare go on. Would you want me to go on? I'll go on. A third, a third issue is this issue of immigration. And it's a biblical issue. Why? It's a biblical issue for, for two reasons. One, certainly we need to be compassionate to many of those folks who are heartbroken and who've traveled here and been taken advantage of. There's that too. But there's also a lot of, a lot of evil. Because we've not 
handled the protection of our people right. Nobody, nobody does what we do as a nation. Every one of you locked your doors when you left your house this morning. And many of you locked your cars. And why is this, why is this a biblical issue? Why is this a church issue? It's a church issue because church, listen, we've got to speak to defend against those who are weak and vulnerable communities that are being taken advantage of because there have been evil people come into the country. That's what we've got to speak. Do we love evil? Do we want people to be hurt? Girls to be killed? Do we, what we, is that what we want? No, we don't want that. That is sin, and that's evil, and that's not righteousness. And so there cannot be something that leads to unrighteousness Abortion, the Equality Act, discrimination, even with this issue of immigration. Education. What if I told you that there was a certain candidate or a certain administration that has been in office and announced in 2022 that any K-12 school receiving government funding must adhere to transgender exclusive policies or risk losing federal funds that, that subsidize free breakfast lunch and snacks to students on low, to low-income families. What if I told you that there was a particular uh, administration that, that took this stand to tell schools what they had to say or not do and controlled their response from, from, from a standpoint of money? What would we say to that church? Is that right? It's not right, church. And so when we look, you say, well, righteousness exalts a nation, but as a sin, as a reproach any people. Now, church, I could, I could get up here and we could just be, we could sanitize the message, right? We could say, well, just sin. This sin, it's just sin. Or we get really specific, and I dared this morning to get real specific about some of the sins that will bring down a nation. And it just so happens that we have an opportunity to say something about these sins that if, 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 they, if, they, if, we, if things go a certain way, it's going to be more prevalent and there are going to be many people who are ungodly and unbiblical and against Jesus and the Bible that are going to celebrate these sinful acts. But these sinful acts will be the undoing of the, of the nation. There will be a reproach that will hang over the nation like a weight. And it will be the nation that our children or grandchildren grow up in. And so what do we do? Well, here's what I would do. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my vote. I'm going to take my stand. I'm going to say righteousness exalt the nation. I'm going to do what, I'm going to do a righteous thing. And you say, well, pastor, there's no, nobody's righteous in this. I understand all that. But there's a clear choice between something that's evil and something that's much lesser. Okay, much lesser. I'm not, I'm not looking, I'm not looking, I'm not looking to vote somebody in that's going to be my Savior. That's already been sealed at the cross, right? I'm not looking for that. I'm not looking to make Jesus out of anybody else that's not Jesus. But I have a choice whether I'm going to let certain things happen in a society based on my vote and based on my decision, or I'm going to, or I'm going to try to stem some of it. And I'm going to try to stem some of the tide of that stuff, Okay. Because righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is reproach any people. I can tell you this. This nation won't save you. The president won't save you. The politicians won't save you. But I do believe we as a church have a moral obligation to speak and live out our faith when we're given an opportunity. Why? Well, we're told to pray for the nation. Right? We're told to pray for our leaders. Why? Paul tells Timothy, so that we can live a tranquil and quiet life. We, we are going to be, in some ways, responsible to the government that's in place, right? We're going to pay our taxes there. We're going to pray for them. And we're going to have to live some sort of life underneath their leadership while we live until Jesus comes back. So let's say something. Let's make our voice heard. I don't need the government to be my Savior. That's only found in Jesus. And so perhaps this morning, you've never come to Christ. You've never been born again. 
I'm telling you what, friends, it'd be more important to me that instead of saving America that we save your soul this morning. So I'd rather you be saved. Amen. No matter the outcome of the election, I want it to go a certain way. Certainly, you and I both do. But listen, my, the most important thing is the soul of a man gets saved. So if you've never received Christ, you'll not go to heaven until you do. If you've never turned from your sins and give your life to Christ, you'll never go to heaven until you do that. Jesus died for your sins. He'll save you from your sins. It doesn't matter what you've done, when you've done it. He'll save you and he'll forgive you of your sins. We're going to sing a song. I want you to come this morning. Maybe you want to come give your life to Christ. Maybe you want to come down to the altar and pray for America. Maybe you want to pray where you're at. Whatever you want to do, you respond to what God's leading you to do this morning. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the day you've made for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you that it speaks to us in a very timely manner in our day and time. Lord, righteousness exalts a nation. When it goes well with the people of God, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. But sin is a reproach to any people. And when the, when the wicked die, the people celebrate. God, turn our hearts and the hearts of this country to Jesus. Lord, I just pray what's most important of all this, yes, there are lives at stake and there's the unborn at stake and so we've got to speak and also Lord the souls of man are at stake so Lord if there's someone here today that's never been saved Jesus you're the one they need so I pray Lord you'd speak to our hearts and help us respond to you in this time of invitation I ask this in Jesus name